Welcome to the Writer's Journey Podcast. I'm Michael Laron, a science fiction and fantasy author on a journey to go from nobody to bestseller, and I'm documenting every step of the way. Tune in every week as I pull back the curtain on my writing life and how I'm building a writing career while working a full-time job, raising a family, and attending law school classes in the evenings. You can find show notes for this week's episode, a free starter library of my fiction, and much more at michaellaron.com. Hello and welcome to episode 153. 153 is a good number, and I titled the name of this episode, Editing Your Book into Nirvana Using Data and Analytics. Now, I hope that you won't run away from me screaming. I have been practicing how I'm going to be delivering this message to you this week in the form of my blog and YouTube community post, and so I think I've got the kinks worked out to where I hope that what I explain in this episode will be interesting to you, will be engaging to you, and might inspire you to do what I'm doing because it will help you eliminate a metric crap ton of typos and spelling errors in your work, and it won't cost you a thing other than just a little bit of your time. All right, so real quick announcements. Um, We did our Writing Power Hour replay, or Writing Power Hour, so uh, thank you to all of you who showed up. We had a great time. I don't know how it went because uh, I'm actually recording this a week in advance. (laughs) More on that in a second. But you can watch the replay by visiting the show notes, uh, and there'll there'll be a link there. A lot of people who can't attend like to watch the replays because they're they're very helpful. So uh, the reason I'm, I'm, I'm... recording this episode early this week, a week early in advance, is because this, uh, as I record this, it is the first week of my law school classes. And so uh, because of that, I really, because I've been out of classes for probably about eight months, I really want to give myself uh, as much opportunity as possible to kind of get back into the swing of things. And so I've recorded, pre-recorded a lot of things uh, to, to move some things off my plate so I can kind of get a jump on the reading. And uh, yeah, so that is why I'm recording this a little early. So I'm not going to do a win for the week, lessons learned, or ideas for the week this week because I want to talk strictly about the topic uh, because this is something I think that is really, really important. So I've started a pilot for a project that I've been talking about for a while on this show. In fact, I've probably been talking about this since 2019, and that is using data and analytics to help me edit my book and catch more errors before the book goes to my editor. And uh, in this episode, what I would like to do is I would like to talk about how this pilot even though I've just barely deployed it, it's, it's not even 24 hours old as I record this, has already taught me a great deal about how to become a better storyteller. It has taught me how to eliminate typos ruthlessly and consistently, and it's going to save me a lot of money uh, over editing costs over the course of my career. All right, so you guys know that I have, I have a, a, a strategy and I have five strategic pillars. And uh, my strategy as an author is to, first and foremost, entertain and delight the the readers in the niches in which I serve. So if I'm writing urban fantasy, my goal is to write the best darn urban fantasy that I can. If I'm writing uh, self-help for writers, my goal is to write the best self-help that I can. And the second part of my strategy is to remain nimble in an ever-changing industry. Because if you look at our industry, things are changing quite rapidly. They are changing very rapidly. I mean, the the, the self-publishing as we know it was completely different in 2014 when I started compared to now. And there's just so much that has changed. Like I said, that it's important to adopt emerging technologies and to make sure that you're staying on top of everything that's happening, because if you don't do that, one day you're going to wake up and be left behind. All right. So that's my mission, to entertain and delight my readers in the genres that I serve and to remain nimble in an ever-changing industry. 
And I do that with five strategic pillars. These are five areas where I spend all of my time as a writer. And you probably know what these are, but I'll repeat them anyway. The first is to be a world-class content creator. So how can I create better books and a better reading experience for my readers? The second strategic pillar is how can I become a world-class marketer? So how can I sell more books to readers and get my books into the hands of more people? The third pillar is to become a technology-driven writer. So how can I use technology, whether it be existing technology or emerging technology, to maximize what I'm doing? And, and primarily when I talk about technology, how can I be more efficient? How can I be more productive? How can I automate certain things so that I don't have to waste my time doing manual processes? And how can I make sure that I'm hiring and bringing in the right people to help me with skills and things that I don't necessarily have the time or expertise to do? And then to, the fourth pillar is to become a data-driven writer, which is all about data and analytics. So understanding my book as a series of data points and figuring out how to make good, sound business decisions that are going to help me unlock the power of my data, unlock the power of my books, and make decisions that are going to make me more money and help me connect more with my readers. And then the fifth pillar, strategic pillar, which is to become the writer of the future. Whatever that means, how can I skate to where the puck is headed? How can I, like I said, adopt emerging technology? How do I scout out what those technologies are? How do I continue to position myself and brand myself so that I can be successful in the future? And so those are the, the pillars that support what I'm doing. And I have to start this conversation with that because I want to make sure that it's clear on why I'm spending my time doing this when I could be spending my time doing a lot of other things. All right, so that's my mission and my strategic pillar. Now, this project in particular, my goal is to focus on how to improve the quality of my self-editing and the quality of my manuscript overall so that readers don't see as many typos. And this very neatly falls into three uh, strategic categories. All right. And as I talk about this, you'll understand why this falls into three categories. This kind of kills three birds with one stone, so to speak. The first is to become a world class content creator. You eliminate the number of typos and errors in your story. That's going to be better for your readers overall. I don't think we have to go into that, right? But this also hits becoming a technology driven writer because of the technology that I'm going to be talking about how I implemented this because this is already on your computer and it won't cost you a thing. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. So how can we, you, you, how do you, how do you unlock the full horsepower of everything that you already have? I think that's a really interesting question that we don't always ask enough of. All right. And then data, data and analytics, which is going to, we're going to talk about this in the very last part of what I'm talking about in that, your edits and the type of errors that you are receiving are a series of data points. And if you learn to think about them a different way, you can start getting some interesting insights into your writing. So this hits three areas. And in any project that I'm working on where it hits three areas, that's kind of a big deal because that means that it's, it's really making a difference across the entire the entirety of my publishing business. This is the same thing with the sales database stuff I talked about last year, where I learned how to automate my royalty statements so that I didn't have to spend very much time doing those. This is like that, but this is a lot easier. The, the, the royalty database thing, on a scale of 1 to 10, it was like an 11. This is, this is like a 2 or a 3. This is, this is a lot easier. All right, so help, I guess, to help set this up, all right. So when you write a novel, you write your book, and then you self-edit that book or you revise that book, and you try to mold the book into a final format before you send it to an editor. And when you are self-editing your book, your goal is to catch as many errors as possible because that's one less thing that your editor is going to have to work on. And so we all 
want to send cleaner manuscripts to our editors, don't we? Because if our editor has to spend less time on the manuscript, we pay less money. <laughs> and then also, your editor is going to tend to do a better job. And they're going to catch uh, all those other typos that you couldn't. And so it's a good thing. But here's the problem that I have with self-editing. And, and, and maybe you've experienced this as well. Um, or, or maybe I'm just speaking to something that maybe you've thought of and just haven't artic- been able to articulate. It's just something that it's something I've noticed over the years. And I think it's it's it's, it's worth stating out loud. All right. Because I think if you state it out loud, then it, it it's like, oh, OK, I, I got it now. OK, so it's hard to remember every single edit that your editor has given you. Right. I mean, think about the last book that you sent to your editor you probably had a lot of edits. And there were probably some things that are like, oh yeah, I probably should. Yeah, you're right, the editor was right on that. I I should remember to do that next time. It's very hard to remember every single thing, right? You know, if the editor corrects you on a word a word that you used incorrectly, or if you know maybe there were ten words that uh, maybe you should have hyphenated and you didn't, you're just not. You can't remember all that stuff. I mean, even if you write it down, there's really no easy way to do that. And also, another problem with self-editing is that your efficiency in self-editing depends on a lot of factors. So it's probably true that if you are self-editing at 7 o'clock in the morning, that you are going to catch a different number of errors and see things differently than if you were self-editing at midnight, right? And if you're self-editing throughout the day, your energy levels and your mood levels and your attention and your distraction levels are going to vary all over the place. And so even though you can be as diligent as possible in making sure that you're trying to catch as much as you can, we're only human. So you're not going to, your, your mind is going to work against you at some point in the editing process and your eyes are going to be tired and you're going to gloss over things that maybe you would have caught if you were more alert. And so what happens, I think, and this is my theory with self-editing is that it, it happen the efficiency or the accuracy is, is in peaks and valleys. All right. There's going to be times where you catch more errors and times where you catch fewer errors. And that's a problem. That's a problem because it means that your, your, your self-editing is probably not as consistent as you would want it to be. Now, here's another thing that's worth thinking about, and again, I'm just going to state this out loud, is that your editor has the same problem. Your editor is just one person. Your editor is only human. Your editor probably makes a living off of editing other people's manuscripts, and they look at words day in and day out. Now, they're professionals at it. They're, they're pretty good at it, but their eyes get tired just like yours and mine. And so, an editor looking at your manuscript at 7 a.m. when they're wide wide awake is going to have a, a different editing mindset at midnight when they're about ready to go to bed, but they're behind on their, their client schedules, and so they've got to get through edits maybe a little bit faster than they normally would. Like I said, I'm just articulating this, right? And so that's a problem. And so then you think about spell checkers like Word and Grammarly and ProWritingAid and White Smoke and all these other apps that are out there, and they only get you so far, don't they? I mean, they catch some things, but they don't catch everything, and by no means are those uh, good substitutes for an editor. So you've got that working against you as well. And then there's also the, the issue of repeat mistakes. So you can't remember everything that an editor recommends. So in the next book, you're probably going to make the same mistakes as much as you want to or not. And repeat mistakes are not productive for you. They're not productive for your work. And they're not productive for your editor. And if you think about it, it kind of makes, if, if you make the same mistakes over and over again in your stories, it makes it harder for the editor to see other issues because they're so focused on those repeat mistakes. It's kind of like being in a room and you're, and you're trying to organize it. It's a lot easier to figure out if something's out of place if a room is clean than if a room is like a pigsty, right? So in a way, you, in a way if you could reduce a lot of those repeat errors, it might help your, error, your editor 
see more errors that they wouldn't have seen because they were distracted by your repeats. Okay, so here is my intent out of all these things. These are things that I've been thinking about for a while. All right. Out of all these things, my intent and my goal was to solve this problem with technology and automation so that you can consistently catch errors that your editor would spot before your editor spots them. All right, that's the key because I think I think what ultimately ends up happening is that people they rely on generic rules of English, right? Everybody reads Strunk and White, and those are the rules that you got to remember. <laughs> Everyone reads uh, grammar grammar guides, and they have, we have all these rules in our head about what we're supposed to do with our books, don't we? But where I'm coming from with this is I don't care about theory. You know, I have a saying. Uh, this is a saying I adopted from a, a great filmmaker named Anthony Q. Artis. You know, he said, I, I could sit here and teach you all about film theory and how to make movies and how movies should be made. But at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is what's practical. I'm not an academic. I'm a pracademic. And I want to keep this practical. So we're not talking about theory. We're not talking about any of this. You got to end your sentence. You can't end your sentence with a preposition or any of that crap. I'm talking about edits that your editor has made to you specifically in the past. How can we catch those errors in advance? All right. That's what I'm talking about. That's how we keep this practical and that's how we keep this that that's how we keep this useful. All right, because we're not talking about pie in the sky. We're talking about you and becoming a better version of yourself and learning the lessons that your editor tried to teach you. Okay, so I created a pilot project. This is something I, I came up with. It, it's been stewing in the back of my head for probably about 18 months, but I, I, I didn't know that I had the skill level to pull it off until now. All right, so this is a pilot project. In many ways, it's kind of a proof of concept, but I'm going to share the preliminary results with you and how all of this worked. And if this is interesting to you, I want to know because I, I think this is something that can help people. All right. So the goal was a system that can you that I could teach my editors prior edits so that the system could catch those exact same edits with my next book before I sent it to the editor. All right. So I like I I try to think about this as could I create a system that is like a an imprint of my editor's brain? Like it's basically like tapping into my editor's brain and applying their eyes to the manuscript and then seeing what they would probably see, right? And the benefit of this is, okay, well, it's not just one editor because I've worked with over a dozen editors. So it would if, if I could figure out a way to teach these edits to the system, I could teach theoretically the edits of all the last 50 books that I did, and I could get the benefit of having 12 different editors' eyes looking at my book with, with technology and automation with the click of a button, all right? So I've been looking into a number of different ways to do this. One of them was uh, natural language processing, which is artificial intelligence. I ultimately settled on not using that uh, for a number of reasons, mainly because it was a bit too complicated and, and over, uh, over my skill level, um, and also because there have been other people or other apps and, and programmers that have done it way better than I have. The second thing I settled on, and this is something that is is really it's kind of an unexpected thing. I, you very rarely hear people talk about this in the community, all right? And that is Microsoft Word macros. Now before you run away screaming, <laughs> hey, let, let me let me explain. Let me explain. Don't run away. All right. So last year I talked about Microsoft Excel macros and how Excel macros are basically automated steps that you can apply to a document to basically help you save time. So if you get a report, like a sales report every month and it's the same and you need to manipulate some of the columns and, and you know change some of the formatting, you could do that and click it and do it the same way every time or you could just write a macro and then click a button and then it does it for you in like half a second. 
All right. So it basically automates things that you were going to do anyway. And when most people hear about macros, they think about Microsoft Excel. All right. But what a lot of people don't always remember is that Microsoft Word also has macros. And Microsoft Word macros are kind of sleepy. They're kind of a boring topic. Um, they're just not very sexy. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> you know, the moment you say Microsoft Word macros, people kind of start falling asleep. But uh, they can help you catch a lot of errors in your editing, and they can help you catch a lot of errors that Microsoft Word spell checker can't. All right, so I hope I have your attention on that. All right, so here's the idea. So, so a macro basically is a series of commands that you tell Microsoft Word to operate. And when you click the button, it executes those commands in like half a second or however long it takes to run through the document. And then you have your intended result. All right, so let me give you a really easy example. Let's say that, um, you know, let's say that uh, you want to, you, you want to use a macro to change the heading styles of all your chapters. So every word that has chapter in it, you want it to go through and change all the all the the characters on that line to heading one. All right, you can write a macro to do that. So it'll it basically the macro will look through the entire document, and every time it sees the word chapter in all caps with two numbers behind it or a number behind it, it'll automatically change that to a heading style. That means you don't have to go through and scroll through and click and do it manually and accidentally miss a chapter, that sort of thing. All right. That's the kind of stuff you could use macros for. All right. So my idea was what if I could embed certain spelling and grammar rules into a macro and then have the macro sweep my manuscript looking for those particular errors. All right. So like an editor makes a recommendation like it like I, the one I use all the time is I, I accidentally used the word cadence incorrectly in a sentence once I should have used the word interval right so what if I could teach a macro or code into a macro to every time any any time it sees the word cadence highlight it so I can just make sure that I use the word correctly or better yet it could it could it could automatically change the word to interval Right. So that way, that was a mistake I made seven books ago. Now it exists forever in a macro and Microsoft Word will catch it every single time. It will never miss. It will never miss. Think about that for a second. I will never, ever use the word cadence incorrectly in a sentence now because of this macro. And it can warn me anytime I'm about to. All right. That's the kind of stuff Microsoft Word macros can do. And really, when you think about it, it's just really, it's just sophisticated find and replace. You know, that's, that's really what it is. And, and so the more, the more edits that uh, my editor recommends, you know, not all edits you're going to be able to do this with, but the more edits your editor recommends, the more you can feed the machine. And then the more accurate and then the more robust it becomes over time with the knowledge of all of the books that you've ever written. All right. Now I, I have to s clarify saying saying that I can only this this sort of thing is only helpful for spelling and grammar errors. Like you can't do this with story errors. Like it's not it's not possible. Like if your character's eyes are blue on page one and they're green on you know page seven, that's not the kind of thing you can catch with this. Um, that is the sort of thing you need an editor for at the time of this recording. Maybe artificial intelligence can help with that in the future. I don't know, but that's that's the kind of edit that's in an editor's domain. All right. We're just strictly looking for spelling and grammar errors. And many of these, many spelling and grammar errors can be caught if you understand how to use find and replace. All right. So what I did is I broke out my last five novels. So I keep all my editing documents, but I decided to do just to, for the sake of time to do this for the last five novels. And I pulled out my last five novels and uh, I pulled out the, the, the word docs with the track changes from my editors. And I went through them and I just kind of read the edits. 
I guess, went through each one. And I, I just started asking, what are the trends? Like, what are the mistakes that I'm making? And so anytime I misused a word, I wrote that word down. Anytime um, I misused uh, a phrase or, or maybe there was a word I used that should have been hyphenated, uh, I, I, I wrote that down. I found that I, I, I misused and abused lay and lie just like everybody else. <laughs> I misused might and, and may. Um, I found that I was dropping determiners like they were hot. So, you know, where I might say uh, topic of the week, I would accidentally forget to leave out the, you know, uh, that happens to everybody, happens to the best of us. Uh, I found um, there was one thing that I did that was really embarrassing uh, that my editor caught, thank God. But uh, there was one time where I used the word scream four times on one page. (laughs) Yeah, I, I had this problem where I accidentally repeat words within a very small radius. And it's painfully obvious to my editor, but not so obvious to me. Uh, And I happen to do that quite a bit throughout the course of one of my novels. And I've never really known how to solve that problem. Um, But I found out that I was I was doing that. Um, Just then there were other things. So I went through my last five books, right? And I just started writing down things. And and I, I started seeing the trends. I started seeing the things that were popping up over and over again. And I started thinking, how can I how can I solve this problem programmatically so that n- these problems will never again be a problem? Like, wouldn't it be cool if an editor recommended a spelling error or a, a certain type of grammar error and you could eliminate it nine out of ten times with a macro that's automated, right? That's that's kind of where I was coming from. And so then I started looking for ways to approach these errors with macros. And I, I started looking at how to write macros which fortunately I know how to do that because of my uh, Excel knowledge that I picked up last year. And so it was really just learning how how Word handles certain things, which is very similar. And so I, I kind of understood the, the language and the programming and all that. And so then I started asking questions. I said, okay, if I wanted to capture this type of error, how would I write a macro for that? And so then I started Googling and stuff like that. And then I, I stumbled across someone who I had stumbled across a long time ago but never really knew how to handle what they were saying. And you know that saying, like, when when the student is ready, the teacher appears? (laughs) Well, I think that when the person is ready or or when the the pain point is high enough, the tool appears to solve the pain point. There's a gentleman by the name of Paul Beverly. Um, I think Paul is, is located in the U.K. And Paul is what I would call... Um, the international Microsoft Word macro expert. He's, this guy is the only guy I know who gets out of bed in the morning and lives and breathes Microsoft macros. Now, the interesting thing about Paul is that Paul is an editor, and Paul uses Microsoft macros to help him with his editing clients. And for the past, uh, I don't know how long he's been doing this, but he's been doing it for a while. Uh, he has been training editors on how to use Microsoft Word macros. And he's written probably over 800 of these things. I mean, that's how serious this guy is. I mean, he's, he is the real deal. And so he's written over 800 macros. And the great thing about Paul is that he shares all of this for free on his website. The only thing you have to do is learn how to keep up with him. All right. And so Paul has started doing YouTube videos Um he actually has a book that's 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 free and it's available on his website, and he publishes a lot of helpful documentation to help people understand how to use Microsoft Word macros and honestly just how to use the macros that he built. And so his audience is primarily editors, but I was I like a couple of years ago I stumbled across this stuff and I was like, okay, this is cool. I just don't know how I would use it. Like I, I got the macros installed and I just didn't know how to use them. Like it didn't, it didn't click. And, but now I stumbled across him again and it did start clicking. Like the stuff he was saying made a hell of a lot of sense. In fact, it made so much sense that it was sending off light bulbs in my head. I'm like, okay, wait, that's, oh, okay. That's how you would use that particular uh, command or, oh, that's, that's what that macro, that's why he, he wanted you to do that. And he has one particular macro. It's called FR Edit. Um, he pronounces it, I believe, Fredit, uh, kind of like a, a like a friend <laughs> macro. All right. And so what this is is this is a uh, 
a, a scripted find and replace. So basically what you can do is put in certain terms or phrases or even certain rules. And what Fredit will do is Fredit will sweep your manuscript and it will, it will change them for you automatically. It's really cool. And then I started thinking, okay, well, this is, this is great and all, but what if, uh, what if like Fredit could, could just insert the changes that I wanted as a track change so that it kind of looked like an editor had worked on it? And it turns out it can do that. So you can start to program all these rules into it, and it's really easy to do. Like, it's not hard. Like, I know I, 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 I say it's easy to do. It is easy to do. Basically, he, he, ha, he, he has made it so that all you have to do is open up a blank Word doc and type in what you want it to find and replace with, and then it will just do it. Like, all you have to do is have another window open. If you can follow instructions in a Word doc, and you can have a separate window open with a list of terms and a list of commands that he provides for you, <laughs> it will work, all right? So that's, that's, how simple, uh, that's how simple this is. And so I started uh, watching his instructional videos. I think it was uh, maybe an hour long worth of uh, instructional videos. I read his entire book in like, uh, like a couple hours. And before long, I was... Uh, uh, handling Microsoft Word macros with the best of them, all right? And so I used Fredit, and um, I basically put together a command. I'm, I'm looking at it right now. Uh, it, it was about uh, 150 different rules. So I went back through all the edits that I found in my last five novels, and then I loaded as many of those as I could into Fredit, and then... I use some of Paul's commands. Like he's got some commands in here. Like I'm looking at it right now. Like it can find any instance of a multiple space. So like how many times have you accidentally hit hit the space bar twice and you just didn't see it, right? Th that will completely eliminate that problem. Um, there's another one where you can um, you can apply you can apply heading styles to all your chapters. That's kind of what I hinted at earlier. Um, if you have a four-figure number, it'll automatically add commas. So, like, if you have the word three thousand, you can it'll automatically put a comma between the the three and the first zero. Um, I've got my book titles in here. So, like, if I'm writing a a, a, a nonfiction book, um, anytime I mention one of my books, I want to make sure that that's italicized. Sometimes I miss that, and my editor has to correct it. And so, lo and behold, I won't go into all of it. Um, but, but that was that was basically the first part. That was Fredit, all right? And so um, then I started thinking about some of the other other issues that I can't address with Microsoft Word macros or that I couldn't address with Fredit, I should say. And the problem of repeating too many words. So like for example, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of apps that will give you statistics and stuff like on your, like on your, your writing and they'll tell you, you use this word 15 times or 20 times or whatever. Um, that's not what I'm talking about when I say repeated words. Like I said, I use the word scream four different times on the same page. I, I use screamed twice, screams once, and then screaming <laughs> another, another time. And all of those instances of the word scream, I did the math, we're within five and eighty-one words of each other. So within a, basically within a one hundred word radius, you would catch it twice, and then within another one hundred radius word, you would catch it, you know, again. And so I was like, okay, is there a way to solve that problem? So I hired a separate programmer developer who specializes in word doc or word macros to basically create something for me that would help me catch that. And so then I, I'm, I'm still looking at a lot of other errors that I'm making and figuring out, is this something I can do with an existing tool or is this something I can do, you know, with, with something else? And so basically what I can do is I can chain the macros that I make and then fret it together into one process. And in one process with clicking one button, I can basically catch a bunch of errors and have Microsoft Word insert them as track changes in the document. 
then it's up to me to simply go through and say, okay, did Word get this right? Did it not get this right? Do I accept it? Do I reject it? All right. So I did this with my most recent book that I wrote, and I wanted to share those details with you about how this went. So it took me, it, it took me like, like two hours to go through and, and get Fredit all set up and to create my own macros and to do all this stuff, all right? So it took me about two hours. It, 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 if, if you're not familiar with this, it might take you probably double that, but four hours is still not that much time, all right? So let me share some of these numbers with you. And I, yes, I am gonna give you uh, a fair amount of numbers here, but I'll, I'll make sure that I c- contextualize them, okay? So I went through my first five novels, or my last five novels, like I said. And what I did is using a Microsoft Word macro, I did not do this manually. If you do this manually, you're just going to pull your hair out, okay? It took me two seconds, or it took the macro two seconds, <laughs> right? My average number of edits for my last five novels, averaged out, was 290 edits per novel. All right, so the editor either made a track change or they made a comment. I added all those together, and it was 290 edits per novel on average. Some were a little bit lower than that. Some were were a little bit higher than that, all right? And then what I did is I approximated the total number of edits per chapter. So that was just some simple math. And that was about 8.5 edits per chapter based on the average number of chapters that I have in my story. So for every chapter, I was pretty much, you could pretty much count on the fact that my editor was going to make about 8.5 edits on average. Some were higher, some were lower. All right. So if you do, if you do a little bit more math on that, that is about one edit per every 177 words. If your novel is about 50,000 words. All right. So that means if, if a standard, if a standard Microsoft Word page of your manuscript is 250 words, right? That's kind of the the universal 250 words is a, is a page, all right? That's about two errors per page. Now, in a perfect world, I'd want to I'd want approximately one edit per 50,000 words. <laughs> That'd be awesome. I mean, I only, I'd only have one typo in my entire book, but no, that's not possible. But you want that number to be as high as possible. It'd be kind of cool if if you know I, I had one edit per 500 words, you know, so that'd be one edit every two pages or something like that. But this is where I'm at. So this is, these, these were my baselines, all right? So 290 edits per novel, 8.5 edits per chapter, about one edit per 177 words, all right? So this became my baseline of everything that I've worked on in the past. So what I did is once I had this set of macros all set up, I basically ran those against my current work in progress to see what it would catch, you know? What's it going to catch? Kind of interesting, isn't it? Like all these different rules that my editors helped me with, how many times did those problems show up in this particular manuscript? What did it catch? And then how can I start putting some numbers to it? All right. So here's what it came up with. So it took the the, the macro sets about two minutes to run. All right. And basically it caught 178 errors in the manuscript. This is before it went to the editor. <laughs> 178 errors. Now, some of those were just a, a word didn't get this right. Um, you know, there were some things where like it just didn't, it, it, was, it was kind of funky, it didn't make sense. So I subtracted the ones that didn't make sense and I left the ones that did. And then I used the macro to count. And that was 166 errors. All right. Now, when the macro when, when the macro counts for one, some weird reason, it counts almost everything twice. So I basically had to divide that by two. So the 166 errors isn't actually 166. It was actually around 80, 83. All right. So that's the, the, the closest approximate number to the number of actual edits issues that my editor has caught in the past. Got to repeat that. That word caught in this manuscript that was legitimate. Okay. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? And so then um, there's another macro that Paul had um, where it, 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 it's kind of helpful because it can catch additional duplicate words. So like if you've got the word he, he, you know, twice, 
<laughs> or she, she, or said, said, you know, how many times have we all done that, right? It just happens. Um, sometimes word can catch those, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but uh, this macro caught seven additional duplicate words, uh, but those didn't show up as track changes. So I added the seven to the 83 number. And then um, I did not spell check this document just out of morbid curiosity to see what word would have caught. And um, there is a macro that you can actually run that will tell you that. So there were seven errors that Word likely would have captured if I had spell checked the document prior. Okay. And then as I was glancing through the document, there were two errors that I caught by eye as I was just glancing through. So th basically when I did the math, the total number of actual errors that the, man that the macros caught was 99. So 99 issues that my editors have caught in the past that showed up in some shape or form in the manuscript here. Now, the book was 38 chapters. So if you divide 99 by 38, that's about 2.36 errors per chapter. All right. Interesting number. OK, so pretend with me for a moment. And I know I'm throwing a lot of numbers at you, but I hope it's making sense. If my editor usually catches an average of 290 total edits per novel. And I captured 99 of those edits proactively before I sent the novel to her. So let's say I could go back in time <laughs> and run it. That means that this, this workflow, this macro set, reduced my total edits potentially by around 34%. So I would have sent her a manuscript that was 34% cleaner, that had 34% fewer errors with a click of a button using automation and tools that were already on my computer for free. All right. Now, if my editor usually catches 8.5 edits per chapter on average, and the engine caught 2.36 spelling and grammar edits per chapter, I just reduced the number of edits per chapter by 25%. 25%. And those reduction numbers, uh, the 34 and 25 numbers, that's conservative because the numbers get even better when you consider that um, I, I was only tracking the total number of edits. So I was counting spelling and story edits. So I bet if you if you pulled if I pulled out just the spelling and grammar edits by themselves uh, in this particular book, which I did not do just because I, I didn't have time to write a macro for that, um, it would be even more drastic. It would probably be somewhere in the 50, 60 percent range, meaning I would have sent my editor a manuscript that was 50 to 60 percent better when you actually pull out the pull out the numbers and, and compare apples to apples. That's crazy, you know, and. Another thing is that the, the repeated part of the, the the repeated word thing, the whole the, the whole scream thing, that's not done yet. I, the developer's still building that, so that would have caught probably even more errors. And then um, Grammarly and ProWriting Aid, I didn't use either of those for this. So if I had used Grammarly, um, Grammarly probably would have caught. You know, I'm just estimating probably somewhere between six and twelve errors on the conservative side. Probably more if I had used it. Pro writing aid probably would have been somewhere there as well. So, you know, I could have been looking at uh, 120 to 130 actual errors caught, um, you know, and when your average number of edits is 290, you start subtracting numbers out of that total and, and you have a pretty damn good, <laughs> pretty damn good efficiency and reduction. And it's going to be correct or as close to correct as possible every single time. Because a computer, unlike you and I, doesn't get tired, right? A computer doesn't um, doesn't have a bad day. It does the same thing over and over every time reliably, right? That is why I ultimately wanted to do this project. Because if I can take more errors off of my plate, one, that's less things I have to remember. Like, I, I, sh I shouldn't be trying to remember whether, uh, you know, do I hyphenate this word or do I not hyphenate it? You know, I shouldn't be trying to remember, hey, you know, I got this word spelled out. Do I do I need to put numerals on it or not? I, I th That's not worth my time. I need to be focused on errors that I, I that only I can catch. 
right? More important things. And with my editor, my editor doesn't need to be correcting lay versus lie every single time. That's on me. That's not on the editor, right? Um, my editor doesn't need to be correcting, you know, using the word cadence incorrectly in a sentence. She gets it, if she corrects it the first time, then every time moving forward, it, that should be on me to take care of. All right. And in other words, too, if you, know, if you think about this, um, might it be true that catching more errors breeds the editor catching more errors? You know, because if there's less on the page or less errors, I should say, on the page, that's more things that your editor is probably going to catch because they're going to see it. It's going to be easier to see. You know, it's gonna, these are going to be things that are hiding in plain sight. So, you know, yeah, I might have reduced the amount of um, uh, errors that uh, my editor would have caught by 34%, but it might also be true that my editor might catch 290 errors in the manuscript still because there's errors that she caught that she might not have caught before. So, or, you know, the opposite could also be true. I don't know. We'll find out. But I think that the more errors I find ahead of time, that's just respectful to the editor. Um, but also, it's the more errors that she might be able to find because those particular things are going to stick out more. So as you can see, this starts adding up in a very big way, especially when you start adding to it over time. And like I said, this is all with free tools and just a little bit of programming costs that I chose to incur. You wouldn't have to choose to incur that. Um, and an understanding of how you can use the full horsepower of the technology that's already on your computer. All right. Pretty, really cool. It's cool stuff. But that's not it. All right. So I, I want you to take everything I just said and, and, and we're going to put that in a little box. Okay. We'll get the box out in a little bit. But just take everything I said and remember it but put it in a little box. Now, that's not all I can do with this editing data. I can also capture all of the edits that, I, that, that have been recommended to me, and I can also do some additional analysis. So in the next phase uh, of this build, wh what I should be able to do is drill down to the chapter level. So basically what I can do is I can get all of um, like the numbers, right? So I had this many track changes, this many comments. I can get all those numbers into Excel. And I can get all those numbers at the chapter level as well. So I, I can have, I can basically populate an Excel sheet that says chapter one has 5,000 words and it had 10 track changes and five edits. And it's maybe a little bit much, but generally speaking, track changes tend to be spelling and grammar errors. And then comments tend to be story errors because the editor's not going to change something about your character, but they'll call it out, right? And so then I can do, basically I can populate all that information at the chapter level. And then I can also see a breakdown at the chapter level of how many spelling errors I got and then how many story errors I made. And then what I can do is I can start to see at a very high level where my editor spent the majority of her time. And then I can start using that to grade myself in terms of how good my self-editing was. All right. So what I, I had this weird idea. This was, I don't know, it sounds fancier than it actually is, but it's the only way I could think to call it. Um, I developed what I called a chapter scoring engine. Um, and, and basically what this does, and it's, it's simple math, it's not complicated, but what it does is it grades how I did in the manuscript, and it tells me where the editor spent most of her time. And then there's a few parameters that I track where I score each chapter based on those. So I'll pull, I'll pull this up here because <laughs> it's easier if I have it in front of me. All right, so for example, I'll just go through some of these. For example, um, if... If I, if I, 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 I believe that the writing method that I use could be an indicator of potentially how many errors I'm going to get. So you guys know I write in a lot of different formats. I write at my laptop. I also dictate while I'm sitting at my desk. I write on my phone. For this last book, I dictated on my bike. I've started using Dragon Anywhere so I can dictate while doing the dishes. And each of those writing methods has... Uh, a different level of uh, quality, right? 
So if I dictate something at my desk, that's probably gonna be higher quality and produce fewer errors than if I dictated something while I was doing dishes when I can't see the screen, right? Um, also, if I'm, if I'm writing on my phone, um, how does that compare to my laptop? Well, my phone is probably going to have more errors, right? And so might it be true, and this is, again, this is all hypothesis because I'm still waiting on my first book to get back, but it could be true that the words that I write on my laptop tend to produce fewer errors and the words that I write on dictation, where I'm like doing dishes, <laughs> tend to produce mo the most errors. So if I was going to be thinking about this, wouldn't I probably want to, wouldn't I probably want to spend a little bit more time self-editing in the chapters where I dictated things multitasking than I did on my laptop? I probably would, right? And that's probably true of my editor. But that's not all. You know, I also think that your writing mood is also an important indicator of um, the number of edits you receive. And again, this is all this is all a hypothesis for me, so I'm going to be very curious to see how this goes. But when I was writing this last book, I also wrote down my mood after I finished each chapter. Because my theory is that when I'm feeling good and things are flowing, I bet I'm probably producing fewer errors, fewer story errors than if I'm feeling horrible for that day. But I bet I'm probably producing more spelling and grammar errors because I'm in flow and I'm not necessarily paying attention to what's on the page. See what I mean? And then um, there's other elements as well, like, uh, if, if, if the total number of edits that you get per chapter are above your average, that's probably a, that, that's a bad sign, right? If it's below, that's a good sign. Uh, if the total number of spelling and grammar errors is above your average, that's a bad sign. And so you can start to add some of these things together. Like, um, like, like, uh, if the number of sessions that it takes me to write a chapter, for example, like if, if I sit down and write a chapter in one setting, how does that relate to, to a chapter where it takes me a week to write because maybe I'm dealing with writer's block, right? I think, is my theory, that a chapter that takes more sessions to write is probably going to generate more errors, right? And then um, there's just other, other components as well, all right? So if you start taking each of these different components and then you rank them and then you score you score each chapter in each of these components – and then average your scores together, you get what I call a chapter score. And then what you can start to do is you can start to assign a numerical value to each of your chapters, all right? And then you can rank them. So you can look at the chapters that performed the worst, and then you can say, okay, chapter four had the worst score out of all this. Now, it's not all about the score, okay? But then you could say, okay, what is driving that? Why is it that I had more edits in this chapter? Okay, well, oh, okay, I got it. I, I did this one on my bike when I was dictating. Oh, and uh, I wasn't feeling very good that day. Oh, and yeah, it, it took me a couple of uh, sessions because uh, I had to go back and loop and, and things are wrong. Oh, that's right. This was a chapter in the perspective of um, some random character that I decided to jump into at the last minute and I had a hard time getting in that character's head. Oh, and this was a fast-paced chapter too. Right. So then you can start to say, OK, how do these different components relate to each other? And then you can start to figure out after the fact what potentially generated the most edits from your editor or the most attention from your editor. And then you can start to remember that stuff moving forward. And then what you can do is you can start running a scoring. You can start running your manuscript through a scoring engine, like a modified version of it, before it goes to an editor to proactively tell you, hey, maybe these are the sections the editor's probably going to spend the most time on. Like predictively, these might be the sections that, that get the most edits. And if you know that, you can start to go through them uh, in additional time uh, through your self-editing. Or you don't do anything at all, and you can simply flag the chapters and tell the editor, hey, you may want to take an extra look at this one. All right, And just be curious to see what happens. Maybe, maybe you're right, or maybe you're wildly wrong. And the point, though, is that you start to get data. You start to understand how your edits and your, your editing analytics, this is what I call it, editing analytics, um, have an impact on your story overall. Now, you can spend a lot of time doing this stuff, and I don't recommend that. 
You know, I think pe- you could probably go overboard with this. And I, I actually don't even recommend that most people even do this second part, like the scoring. One, I don't even know if it's going to work. So I'll share the the learnings I have with you on that. Two, I, just, I think it's probably more complicated than what most people want to do. But I do think that the macro piece, by all means, that's easy to do, right? This is just more conceptual. Um, it's just something I'm sharing out of transparency because I think some of you might dig it, all right? Um, so yeah, I mean, you basically can generate all this data with automation. You don't have to sit down with a pen and paper or go through every single thing to calculate all this information manually. You can do it all with with formulas and, and macros. And, you know, th- th- this sort of thing doesn't shouldn't become anything that 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 drives everything you're doing. It just becomes an additional data point to help you make decisions in your self-editing that are going to help you reduce the amount of errors that you have for uh, your book. And if you can do those things, see, remember the North Star. The North Star is fewer errors in your book, which means readers are going to enjoy your book more, right? And that's going to lead to better reviews, and that's going to lead to better sales, all right? So that's what I've been working on <laughs> this past week or so. And uh, I, the pilot has been a huge success so far. I, once I get the, the manuscript back from my editor, that's going to be the real test. That's when I can start building out this second piece. So I'll share more on that when I get there. But I think that these numbers, you know, a 34% reduction in errors, that's pretty amazing for something that I was able to do for free with a tool that was already on my computer, right? And um, yeah, I mean, I could even do better with pro- Grammarly and ProWriting Aid. You know, one of the one of the problems that I have with my edits, and I, I'm sure this is probably true to a lot of people listening to this, is sometimes I drop articles. So I'll drop the word the or I'll accident like I'll dictation is this especially happens with dictation where you'll say you'll say something and then dragon won't pick up that you said the word a or an you know and it doesn't and, and you don't catch it you know so that 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 tends to be a problem that's unique to dictation but every writer has the problem and when you're looking at that it's easy to miss those articles because they're so tiny and your brain kind of pretends that they're there and your editor doesn't always catch them either and what I found is that Grammarly is actually pretty good at catching those. Um, in fact, Grammarly caught a fair amount of them after the fact, after I kind of went through and looked at it. So implementing that into the workflow just for the, the determiner piece, I think is pretty important. And then Pro Writing Aid caught a couple of them that Grammarly didn't catch as well. So, you know, if you think about you think about your editing process as a series of steps, um, step one is, you know, doing your own review on the manuscript. Step two is, is running these, these macros. Step three, potentially optionally, is, is using a, some sort of scoring engine to tell you how you're doing. Step four, uh, to use you know, Word, Grammarly, Pro Writing Aid, all together to catch additional errors that you would have missed. And then step, you know, step five, I think that's where we're at. <laughs> a proofreader, I mean, we're pretty much sealed the deal. And you would never have to really worry that much about um, well, you have to hire an editor too, a copy editor, and then a proofreader would seal the deal. Um, you would really not have to worry about spelling and grammar errors in the future, assuming you hire the right editor. And isn't that a great thing, right? Because your, your readers can focus more on the story. So anyway, I hope that this has been interesting to you. I know that this has probably been one of the longest episodes of the writer's journey ever. <laughs> but uh, this is this is what I'm working on. And um, I hope that I hope to be sharing more of this in the future, um, particularly step-by-step instructions on how some of you can accomplish some of this yourself. I'm not going to charge any money for it. It's Like I said, all these tools are free. I, I'm a big believer in just giving out good information. And if it can help you catch some more typos, uh, I think that's a win. So have a wonderful week. I will talk to you next week. And peace. Thanks for joining me this week. If you enjoyed this episode, you'll enjoy my backlist episodes at michaelaron.com slash podcast. For your free starter library of my favorite novels, join my fan club by visiting michaelaron.com slash fan club. If you're a writer and want to connect with me further, check out my YouTube channel, Author Level Up, for helpful writing advice at authorlevelup.com. Thanks for listening, and I'll be back next week.